So welcome to my Industry Insider series where I'm going to be sharing some industry insights that I often get asked questions about with you. Since I've just flown in from New York to Paris, this one's very much on my mind and something I get asked about quite a lot. So what's the difference between the fashion capitals? I'm Alexandra Alenska and I've worked as a creative director and stylist for luxury brands including Chanel Celine and Vanessa Bruno, as well as magazines including Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. And I've been featured in international press, including Forbes, Elle, The Sunday Times and The Independent. I now help directors and leaders in midlife and beyond to rebalance that work, 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 busy, busy, busy lifestyle you've become accustomed to. Because you know life's too short to stay in that career driven comfort zone. I help you to redesign and restyle your life, especially at midlife with life changing transitions such as the breakup of relationship, divorce, menopause, or turning 40 and beyond. From your home and your wardrobe to your mind and social life, I help you with your stylish next chapter to step into your best life because I know you're ready to rock life again. So I'm British of Eastern European origin and have spent most of my career in Paris, working for brands such as Vanessa Bruno, Chanel and Celine. So I've got quite an insight into what goes on in those different fashion capitals and how clothing varies. So although the world becomes more globalised, there are still fundamental differences between Paris, New York, London and Milan. Paris, of course, is perhaps the home of haute couture, our clothes that were made for the aristocracy and seen worn at the French courts. The aim of fashion was partly to support the French economy. Today, of course, things have changed and you see French brands all over the world. Of course, in the 1990s, we've seen the rise of the big fashion groups, the big conglomerates, such as the Gucci Group, as it was then called, and the LVMH Group. And they've really meant that fashion has expanded globally and you can buy Louis Vuitton bags all over the world, although there are still limited edition pieces available only in Paris. We're also seeing fashion has a much more globalised customer base. It's amazing to me that we have extraordinary fashions coming out of Korea, for example, or Shanghai, but we don't yet have um, an Asian capital of fashion in the same way as we do these, these more traditional fashion capitals. So Paris, of course, is the oldest fashion capital. Cardinal Colbert bought ideas of luxury in, partly taking some artisans from Italy um, to help support the French economy. Because the more um, appearances that men and women had at court, for example, the more outfits they had to wear. Fashion was exclusively for the elite. And of course, all of this changed on a global level in the 1980s, where we started to see fashion coming from the streets. And now, of course, fashion, the idea of fashion has become a lot more democratized. So fashion in Paris is a very international playground. Many of the big brands in the world want to be seen at Paris Fashion Week. But then aside from that, we still have this idea of what Paris fashion means. So I suppose there's a difference between the industry of fashion and you know what people wear on an everyday level. In Paris, fashion is really integral to culture. It's a sign of self-respect. It's a self-expression. It's showing that you know what you're doing, that you know how you want to be seen, how you want to be perceived by others. It's really fundamental to your everyday being in France. And you'll see those designer logos and stores on every street corner in Paris. It's really part of life. Even if you can't afford to buy a Chanel bag, it's all just there as part of your culture. And indeed, these big brands also sponsor um, various cultural establishments and exhibitions. At the moment, for example, Chanel is sponsoring the renovation of the Grand Palais, which is one of my favorite buildings in Paris and where they have many of their fashion shows. So in France, we could say that traditionally, French style is all about that history, that historical aspect. In fact, the very phrase haute couture can only be used within France. It's a bit like champagne. You have to be a brand that has to be one of the 15 brands, I think, that is named haute couture by the French Federation of haute couture. Otherwise, you're not supposed to use that terminology haute couture, which means, of course, handmade. So France is very much impacted by this tradition of haute couture, those handmade clothes, that fashion week that we have in January and July. Um, and that tradition really infiltrates the ready-to-wear collections that we see later on in the year. So of course, twice a year, we have this idea of the fashion industry all coming to Paris. And we have many international brands showing in Paris Fashion Week because of this history um, of you know, French fashion. It's, um, it's a very traditional fashion center. So we have the Japanese coming, you know, Comme de Garçon and Yoji Yamamoto. We have the Belgians coming, Dries van Noten shows in, in Paris. You know, really there's designers from all over the world that descend. And it's a really important sales center for many of the European designers, even 
those from London will come and have a showroom in Paris Fashion Week, even if they've been showing in London Fashion Week. And that really is different to what you see French people wearing on the street, where we have this other idea of, you know, what a French woman looks like or what French style is, which is perhaps a lot more classic. And it's this idea of building your wardrobe um, to create something that's going to last, that you're going to invest in. It could be those pieces from the, some of those traditional French brands like Chanel or Hermes that you're going to have for years to come. And it's a lot less trend focused. Whereas in Paris Fashion Week, we see a burst and exploration of all of those new trends. It's a really significant fashion center in terms of trends and what's going on. In Italy, of course, in Milan, we have all of those wonderful, embroidered, vava room, sexy Italian brands. Now, of course, it's significant to say that we are making generalizations here. In, in America, for example, we consider New York fashion to be all about the street. And New York Fashion Week, of course, is a lot newer than something like Paris Fashion Week. So traditionally, we associate it with those big labels where they've got diffusion lines, the Calvin Kleins, the Donna Karens, traditionally. But there are, of course, those brands in New York, such as Proenza Schooler, who are making extremely refined um, quite ladylike clothes, but very, very modern, that look great on a lot of different types of women from all over the world, including Paris. So we mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of this idea of, you know, the street culture coming out from the 1980s, that was really something that was really important in both London and in New York, where we had the rise of punk. Um, so punk really established London fashion as something very different. London Fashion Week today is still very inspired by that punk heritage. So it's known for avant-garde designers, for cutting edge designers, for young designers. That comes with its own pitfalls, of course. It means that the press will go to London to look for the next cool thing, but not necessarily great for sales. So as I said, a lot of those designers from London will go to Paris to do showrooms and to actually sell things. Often they'll start off in London, which again is this international melting point, of course, with Central St. Martins and the fantastic master's course there that I did myself. You see loads of incredible young designers coming out of that course. Um, and many of the other universities in London, where they're really quite experimental. They're really, fashion is about self-expression. It's about looking at what people see in the street. It's about being inspired by mixing cultures, about what you see in the street, all that punk heritage still coming through um, in terms of looking out and seeing what people are wearing. In London, of course, you still see people wearing all sorts of things. It's a lot less conservative than um, traditional Parisian fashion, for instance. London has an undeniable energy. You never know what exactly you're going to see. Sometimes quite unwearable, crazy collections. And sometimes designers, some of my peers, for instance, Roxanda Ilinchic, Christopher Kane, who have gone on to become really established designers in their own, in their own way. The British Fashion Council also has a lot of grants that support young designers and young talent. And there's various private funding bodies as well. So it's a great place for young designers to start their careers and for experimental designers to, well, do just that, experiment. It's creative, it's exciting, it's fueled by London's punk heritage. But once you're a bit more established, then you move to Paris or you move to New York. So New York, as I said, is all about the big brands. It's about business. Fashion is about commerce, generally speaking. It's about what sells, and it's the home of diffusion lines. Call them what you like, the cruise collections, the inter-season collections, the pre-season collections, it's all the same, really. It's just those, those more commercially driven collections that now designers around the world, including London's young designers, are having to do, as consumer demand means that people are expecting more and more drops, that is to say, more and more products in the stores and online because fashion has become so democratized as a result of the rise of the internet. Fashion Week, of course, although you can watch the shows often via live streaming at home, it's still a very small industry. There are approximately 400 people that attend a fashion show from all over the world, press and buyers. Um, and at the Ocature shows, buyers also includes, of course, private clients and of course, celebrities. But that's about it, really. You have to be in the industry to be able to attend Fashion Week. You can't necessarily just buy a ticket in the same way as you could to go to the cinema or the theatre. Milan fashion, of course, celebrates La Dolce Vita and the Italian woman in all her curvy splendor. It's very different to that tradition of, you know, something a bit more refined and elegant that we have in Paris. Although, of course, still birthplace to those very refined designers such as Emporio Armani. 
We celebrate Italian fashion though not only for those curvy brands like Dolce & Gabbana or Roberto Cavalli that are full of va va voom and sexiness, but also for the the traditions of craftsmanship that come out of Florence, for example, the leather goods, the attention to detail. I was once doing some consultancy for the Caring Group and got to go on a tour of the shoe factory of the Gucci Group. It was extraordinary. The amount of handiwork, of craftsmanship that goes into a single pair of shoes is quite breathtaking. So to sum up, generally speaking, New York is about business and commerce. It's about selling clothes. It's about those brands that are more commercially oriented. Paris is about the traditions of haute couture and about celebrating the latest trends. Milan celebrates Italian refinement and also that idea of la dolce vita, the colors, the prints, the patterns, and the craftsmanship. And London reflects on its punk heritage to celebrate the latest in cutting edge trends and designers. Et voila, I hope you've enjoyed today's video and thank you so much for watching. Bye bye, à la prochaine.